ahead and so first of all, I wanted to thank you all for joining us tonight. I know you've been teaching all day, many of you, and you're tired. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, please keep the chat lively as our presenter is presenting tonight. There's also a Q&A session or a little button at the bottom where you can ask specific questions that we will answer at the end. Um, and you'll also have a survey at the end that will pop up. So if you could answer that, that is helpful to us at NCHE as well. Just a plug for a couple other webinars that we have this week. So tomorrow at the same time, racial exclusion in the Midwest with Chad Montry from UMass Lowell. On January 23rd, we have redlining racism and segregation in Detroit with Jeanette Pierce from the City Institute. And then the very next day on January 24th, Exodus from Dixie, the Great Migration as a Social Movement with DeVarian Baldwin from Trinity College in Connecticut. So those are some of our upcoming webinars for January. If you don't find anything that you really like out of that, check out some that um, are later in the year that are posted all the way until May at this point. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our presenter tonight. William Lehman is an associate professor of history and a faculty fellow at the Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, which also happens to be my undergraduate alma mater. So I'm super excited for tonight's session. His research focuses on the interaction between American political and military institutions and the larger society and culture that they serve. He earned his PhD from Boston University and taught at the United States Military Academy at West Point before moving back to his home state of Rhode Island to teach at Salve Regina. He is the author of The Long Road to Annapolis, the founding of the Naval Academy, and the Emerging American Republic. Thank you so much, Bill, for being here with us tonight. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Shauna, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to the National Council for History Education for the invitation to speak to you this evening about the often overlooked War of 1812. Uh, just give me a moment here to share my screen. So one of the things I want to do first is to just give you a bit of an overview of what we're going to be talking about this evening. And so we'll start out going over the origins of the war. How did the war come about? Um, we'll talk about the major campaigns during the war, both on land and at sea, starting out with the campaign against Canada then talking a little bit about the naval war. Uh, and then wrapping up with the British attack on the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Hartford Convention, which was a group of Federalist politicians from New England who were very much opposed to the war um, and met together in Hartford, Connecticut, and came up with a series of resolutions um, to, to try to restore the power of New England Federalists um, and weaken the power of the politicians that they felt brought them into the War of 1812. Uh, then we'll talk about the famous Battle of New Orleans, uh, which is really Andrew Jackson's big claim to fame, um, ultimately resulting in him winning election to the White House. And then we'll wrap up uh, talking about the Treaty of Ghent, uh, which was the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812. Uh, and then after that, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the war's legacy. Okay. In many ways, and, and certainly from the British perspective, the War of 1812 was more of a sideshow than a main event. A small component of a much larger war between Britain and France the first began in 1793 and reached a whole new level of intensity with the rise to power of Napoleon. Even among Americans, the War of 1812 is often forgotten, sandwiched between the much more dramatic American Revolution and Civil War. 
In fact, the standard history, um, in many ways, the most respected history, one volume history of the War of 1812, um, its actual title is The War of 1812, A Forgotten Conflict. Um, American history textbooks, or at least the ones I've seen uh, for my students on the college level, talk about the War of 1812 in maybe a few pages. It's not really given all that much attention. Yet, as we're going to be talking about tonight, the War of 1812 was a crucial moment in American history. Between the end of the Revolutionary War and 1812, America's status as an independent nation was always somewhat precarious. And many European observers at the time did not expect the new American Republic to last very long. The new country faced numerous national security threats, including from the British in Canada, the Spanish to the South, and Native Americans on the Western frontier. Internal divisions within American society, seen most clearly in the rise of partisan politics by the 1790s, and that featured the country's first political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, this internal strife seemed to undermine national unity and threaten the Republic's survival. But as we're going to see, taking on the British a second time and living to tell the tale would prove to be a decisive moment when American independence finally became secure, meaning that the War of 1812 deserves more attention than it often receives. In terms of the origins of the conflict, we have to go back um, into the earlier years of the 19th century. And simply put, the United States was simply caught in the middle of a struggle for dominance in Europe between France and Britain. Britain had the stronger navy and France had the stronger army, which meant that the war quickly became a stalemate and neither side really was achieving its objectives. Both countries believed it was vital to cut off the enemy's supplies, and that meant the United States. Since America conducted trade with both Britain and France, and in fact was an important supplier of food for both sides. Although both sides interfered with American commerce and American shipping, Britain was worse since it had the stronger Navy. Particularly troubling to Americans was the British practice of impressment. The British Royal Navy was the largest in the world, and it required a huge number of men to operate its ships. Not surprisingly, the Royal Navy didn't get a whole lot of volunteers because of the very harsh living conditions that British sailors were subjected to. Poor food, extremely strict discipline, including severe corporal punishment. Desertion from the Royal Navy, as a result, was very common. And many British Navy deserters joined the US Navy or the American Merchant Marine because they usually provided better living conditions and often better money. To deal with its manpower problems, Britain began the impressment of suspected British deserters on US ships. The way this would take place is that a Royal Navy ship would come alongside an American ship and board it. British would simply take anyone into custody that they suspected of being a Royal Navy deserter. Now, some of the men taken during these impressment raids were in fact British deserters but many of them were United States citizens, either by birth or by naturalization. From 1803 to 1812, approximately 3,000 Americans were forced into service in the Royal Navy. And this was considered an insult and a direct challenge to United States sovereignty. Probably the most notorious example of British interference with American ships came in the summer of 1807 when a British warship attacked the USS Chesapeake in US territorial waters off the coast of Virginia. After the Chesapeake's captain had refused to allow the British to board his ship to look for deserters. In this attack, three US sailors were killed and 18 were wounded. The British boarded the ship and took four men into custody. Americans were completely outraged. President Thomas Jefferson had to respond in some way. Jefferson was a firm believer in peaceful coercion rather than war as a means of settling disputes. He and his fellow Democratic Republicans feared war's effects on the Republic. And these effects included 
such undesirable things as increased debt, large and costly professional military establishments, higher taxes, and curtailed civil liberties. Jefferson ended up resorting to what today we would call economic sanctions against Britain and France. He shut down U.S. commerce, prohibiting American, uh, excuse me, prohibiting imports from coming into America and prohibiting American exports from going to other countries. Jefferson believed that both nations relied so heavily on American trade that this would convince them to respect America's rights as a neutral power on the high seas. Ultimately though, to make a long story short, the strategy proved to be completely ineffective and in fact only hurt American merchants and hurt the American economy. Jefferson ended up leaving a complete diplomatic mess for his friend and successor, James Madison, to deal with when Madison was elected um, in 1808. Upon taking office, President Madison decided to take a different approach. He would announce that he would restore full trade with whichever country agreed to stop interfering with U.S. commerce, and he would cut off all trade with the other. Napoleon agreed to stop interfering with U.S. ships, although he had no intention of actually complying with that. Madison, though, took him at his word and restored commerce with France. Britain continued impressing sailors and interfering with American trade, so Madison cut off all involvement with Britain in 1811. There were also some problems for the United States involving Native Americans in the Northwest. Several treaties had been negotiated between the United States and various tribes in the old Northwest Territory, which would be the present day states of Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and Indiana. In these treaties, Native Americans had ceded land to the United States. The Shawnee leader Tecumseh tried to unify area tribes into a confederation in an effort to defend native lands against invasion by white settlers. This not surprisingly led to open hostilities and a battle between Native Americans and U.S. forces led by General and future President William Henry Harrison at Tippecanoe Creek in 1811, which led to the total destruction of a Native American village. Many Americans blame the British in Canada for inciting the Native Americans in the Northwest Territory. Among those Americans that were most concerned about the Native American problem were members of the freshman class of the U.S. House of Representatives who took office in the spring of 1811. This class in the House was led by a new breed of young, ambitious, and aggressive Democratic Republicans from the West and the South. They were staunch nationalists who advocated war against Britain and against Native Americans and they became known as the Warhawks. Their leaders, and the most famous of them, were Congressman Henry Clay of Kentucky and Congressman John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, two of the most influential politicians in the United States in the 19th century to have never become presidents. The Warhawks' ultimate goal was Canada, which they believed would provide the United States with abundant new lands, and would stick it to the British by depriving them of a major colony. Kicking the British out of Canada would also help with the Native American issue on the frontier. So by 1812, President Madison is in an increasingly difficult situation. Economic coercion, which had actually started under Jefferson, had failed to get Britain to stop interfering with American commerce and the impressment of American sailors. British were increasingly being blamed for riling up the Native Americans on the frontier, and there was certainly some truth to that. The Warhawks were constantly clamoring for war and pressuring Madison to move in that direction. The Warhawks were constantly arguing that national honor demanded the United States declaring war, and that this was a golden opportunity to expand into Canada and to eliminate the British presence in North America. Madison, over time, came to believe that the capturing of Canada might, in fact, force Britain to respect America's rights as a neutral power. It might also hurt the British economy, since Canada provided the British Empire with food. 
Seeing no other option, on June 1st, 1812, President Madison asked Congress for a declaration of war. He cited as reasons, impressment of American sailors, and interference with America's rights as a neutral power on the high seas. In his mind, the United States could never truly be an independent nation as long as it allowed Britain to push it around. But the decision for war was by no means unanimous. And in fact, for a declaration of war, the votes were relatively close in each House of Congress. In the House of Representatives, the vote was 79 to 49 in favor of war, and in the U.S. Senate, 19 to 13, with particularly members of the Federalist Party staunchly opposed to the war, mainly for economic reasons. Unknown to Madison or to Congress was the fact that the British government in London, not wanting another war on its hands, already dealing with Napoleon, had repealed its orders authorizing the impressment of American sailors and authorizing the interference with U.S. shipping. Because of the threat posed by Napoleon, Britain was cutting off or was cut off from trade with much of the European continent, and as a result, wanted to restore trade with America. The slow communications of the early 19th century meant that this news did not reach Washington, D.C. in time for it to have a difference. So had there been better communication in the early 19th century, the War of 1812 never even would have happened. Okay. In retrospect, war was not a good idea. In fact, even at the time, the condition of the U.S. military should have been cause for concern among even the most ardent war hawks. The U.S. military was not ready to fight another war with Britain, and the war effort was hampered right from the start by one problem after another. Perhaps the biggest issue involved manpower and recruitment. The United States Army in 1812 had less than 7,000 professional regular soldiers. The British Army at the time could field over 250,000 professional soldiers. There were recruiting troubles in America, particularly in New England, where the war was extremely unpopular and labeled Mr. Madison's War. And kind of a good rule of thumb is when they name the war after you and your president, that's really never a good sign. It's never meant as a compliment. Um, it means you're being blamed for the war. Massachusetts and Connecticut refused to provide the federal government with any militia troops, stating that the militia would only be used to defend their state if invaded by the British. There was a lack of competent officers for the army. The United States Military Academy at West Point had been established in 1802, but had not yet been in operation long enough and had only graduated a relatively small number of trained officers. And those trained officers were still, um, since it was only 10 years or less earlier that they graduated, were still in relatively junior ranks. Many of the top ranking officers were actually politicians with connections. People who lacked previous military experience in, in a lot of ways were simply looking for glory that would advance their political careers. And in most cases, they really lacked any real military knowledge um, that would be necessary for their posts. State militia units were generally ineffective as soldiers in combat, and they often refused to go beyond the borders of their home state. The U.S. Navy had fewer than 20 warships in active service in 1812 to take on the Royal Navy, which, as I've said earlier, was the best in the world. And in 1812, the Royal Navy had approximately 1,000 warships in commission. Of course, much of the British Army and Navy were engaged in Europe against Napoleon's forces. But the United States still had no sound or realistic strategy and no clear war aim. The further issue was Madison becoming a wartime commander-in-chief. Now, there's certainly no denying that James Madison had a great deal of political experience. He had been the driving force at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, earning him the nickname the Father of the Constitution. In the 1790s, Madison was a very influential congressman from his home state of Virginia. And he had spent the previous eight years before his presidency serving as Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State. But Madison seemed overwhelmed as president. 
He had no previous military experience. He was not in any way considered to be a charismatic leader. In fact, historian Gordon Wood of Brown University has referred to Madison as, quote, by far the most uncharismatic president the country had yet experienced, end quote. Madison was known for being very shy and reserved, and he was also physically unimposing. Madison remains our shortest president at five feet, four inches in height, and he always had a somewhat sickly appearance. The first American campaign, not surprisingly, was going to be directed at Canada. Canada, of course, um, it featured prominently in Madison's decision-making process. Canada was certainly desired by the war hawks that have been clamoring for war for a while at this point and pressuring Madison to engage the British in a war. Canada also seemed like a good place to start for a couple of reasons. First, the Royal Navy would not be much of a factor. And second, Canada was defended by only a few small garrisons of British soldiers. Unfortunately for the United States, though, the Canada campaign was a disaster from the start. Not surprisingly, given Americans' actions against the Native Americans in the Northwest Territory, Tecumseh's Confederation allied with the British. The governor of the Michigan Territory, General William Hull, attacked British and Native American forces just over the Canadian border near Detroit. He was easily overwhelmed and forced to retreat. First Detroit, and then Fort Dearborn, on the site of present-day Chicago, were captured by the enemy, and Hull was forced to surrender. A second front opened in the Niagara area on the border between New York State and Canada. The results weren't much better. U.S. Army forces failed to get reinforcements from the New York State militia, which refused to cross into Canada, and the Americans were soundly defeated. The same thing happened near Lake Champlain. An attempt by the United States to attack Montreal was thwarted because militia troops again refused to cross the border into Canada. Despite this embarrassing start to the war though, James Madison was comfortably reelected president in 1812, though by a smaller margin than he had been in 1808. Um, it's not really that surprising. Generally, presidents in wartime um, do get reelected. Really, the only bright spot for the United States in the early stages of the war was the U.S. Navy. American ships engaged in one-on-one -on -one battles with British ships and won some impressive victories. The most famous of these naval duels was between the USS Constitution and the HMS Guerriere on August 19, 1812. During the battle, the Constitution earned its famous nickname, Old Ironsides, when British cannonballs appeared to bounce off its wooden hull. The Constitution is actually still afloat today um, and is actually still a commissioned warship in the U.S. Navy. Um, so it can still be referred to as the USS Constitution. It is a museum ship in Boston. So if you're ever in the Boston area, um, I strongly recommend visiting the Constitution. The ship itself is really interesting to go through, um, but there's also a really good museum uh, right next door to the ship. So if you are in the Boston area, definitely check it out. Despite the fact that these victories served an important purpose in boosting American morale, they weren't really that important to the war effort in a strategic sense. And in fact, the Royal Navy by 1814 had effectively blockaded the United States Atlantic coast. The Navy did, however, play an important strategic role on the Great Lakes. Britain planned to use the Great Lakes as a route to invade the United States. Since neither side had ships on the lakes, a shipbuilding race broke out. In September of 1813, a small U.S. Navy force under Oliver Hazard Perry of Newport, Rhode Island, so my Rhode Island pride is gonna get the best of me here, um, but Oliver Hazard Perry becomes one of the greatest naval heroes in American history by defeating the British on Lake Erie. So again, that's September of 1813. And then a year later, Thomas McDonough is going to defeat the British um, on Lake Champlain. And so you had these two victories on the Great Lakes, which pretty much affected, effectively ended the British attempt to invade the United States 
um, through the Great Lakes. In addition to U.S. naval supremacy on the lakes, General William Henry Harrison's army drove British and Native American forces out of the Northwest and back into Canada. Tecumseh was killed in battle, which led to the disintegration of his confederation. After defeating the British and the Native Americans, Americans sacked the city of York in Canada, uh, which is present day Toronto, and burned it to the ground. Okay, so up to this point, the British have been a little frustrated in their efforts to invade the United States by way of the Great Lakes or the Northwest. So the British are going to turn their attention to the Chesapeake Bay area in 1814. They plan to attack Washington, D.C., and then Baltimore. The British advanced on Washington in, 18, in August of 1814. The capital city, surprisingly, was defended only by a few local militia units. James Madison rode out on horseback in an attempt to rally the troops and oversee the defense of the city. This would actually be the second and the last time that an American president personally commanded troops in the field as commander in chief. Um, for Jeopardy purposes, if any of you are ever on Jeopardy and this can win you thousands of dollars, um, the first time that a president served as commander in chief in the field was George Washington during the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. He personally assumed command uh, of military forces which headed out to Western Pennsylvania to put down that rebellion. Unfortunately, James Madison was no George Washington. Washington, of course, was a former general who looked the part. Washington was 6'2", he was athletic, he was an expert horseman, and he was a commanding presence, to put it mildly. Not to mention the fact that, obviously, he's a military expert. James Madison was by no means a military expert, he was short, frail, and at the time suffering from a pretty bad head cold, which gave his voice a high-pitched nasally sound that made him sound kind of ridiculous. So in the end, Madison's efforts to rally the troops completely failed, and the British entered Washington, D.C. Dolly Madison was waiting for her husband to return to the White House from the field and had just had dinner put on the table when someone rushed in and told her that she had to evacuate because the British were advancing on the White House. Dolly quickly left the White House, rescuing some of its treasures, including the Gilbert Stuart portrait of George Washington that hangs today in the East Room. British soldiers entered the White House, sat down at the dinner table, ate the Madison's dinner, and then set the building on fire. The British also burned the United States Capitol and several other buildings. At the time, the United States Capitol building also included the Library of Congress. Today, of course, the Library of Congress has three separate buildings outside of the Capitol, kind of like right across the street from the Capitol. Back during the War of 1812, the books were located in the Capitol building itself and the, the entire Library of Congress was destroyed by the fire set by the British. The, those books were later replaced when the U.S. government purchased Thomas Jefferson's personal library, um, basically to help Jefferson pay off his debts. Um, a little bit of a tangent, but Thomas Jefferson was kind of a spendthrift in his private life, and he was in debt up to his eyeballs um, during most of his adult life. And his debts reached the point that he had to do kind of something dramatic to, to make enough money to start paying them off. And so Jefferson and the U.S. government agreed uh, that he would sell his entire personal library, which was very extensive and included thousands of books. Um, he would sell his personal library to the government, and that became the new Library of Congress. It's believed that the burning of Washington, D.C. was retaliation by the British for the burning of York in Canada um, earlier by American forces. After torching Washington, D.C., the British then moved against Baltimore. They bombarded Fort McHenry, which was the fort that defended the city, with over 1,500 rounds over a 25-hour period from September 13th to the 14th, 1814. 
Fort McHenry was known for having a very large, oversized American flag flying above it. And despite this 25-hour bombardment, Fort McHenry held. And the next morning, the American flag was still flying over the fort. The fort had not surrendered. Um, if you're wondering, this is the gigantic American flag that is now on display at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., a young Georgetown lawyer named Francis Scott Key viewed the British bombardment from a British ship. He was on board the ship to secure the release of a Baltimore doctor who had been taken prisoner by the British. He was inspired by the sight of the American flag flying over Fort McHenry, and he wrote a poem that he called the Star Spangled Banner on the back of an old letter that he happened to have in his pocket. The poem was later put to music, specifically the tune of an old English drinking song, and it became a very popular American patriotic song and, of course, became our national anthem in 1931. It did take a while, um, not until 1931, but that's the origins of the national anthem. And next time you hear it, you can always remember that it's an old English drinking song, or at least the tune. As I mentioned, New England was always very uneasy about the War of 1812. Um, in fact, I would say like staunchly opposed to it. New England was the only part of the country that was still dominated by the Federalist Party by the War of 1812. And the Federalists essentially saw the war as dangerous, unnecessary, and a detriment to American commercial interests. New England also tended to be a little more pro-British than the rest of the United States was. And so that was certainly a factor as well. Believe it or not, New England's opposition to the war even included some talk of secession from the Union. In October of 1814, the Massachusetts State Legislature called for a meeting of delegates from the New England states to discuss opposition to the war, which in the minds of the New England Federalists was a war by Western and Southern Democratic Republicans that was against the interests of New England. Delegates, all of them Federalists, from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Vermont, met in the Old State House in Hartford, Connecticut, from December of 1814 to January of 1815. The so-called Hartford Convention adopted a series of um, proposed resolutions, um, mostly in the form of amendments to the Constitution, designed to undermine the power of Western and Southern Republicans um, those same politicians who had initiated the war. Um, and what the Federalists are trying to do is to limit the power of those politicians and increase the power of New England again. So there are really three main resolutions that the New Englanders in Hartford are proposing. First, they wanted to eliminate what's known as the three-fifths rule in the United States Constitution. The three-fifths rule argued that um, enslaved persons within the United States would count as three-fifths of a person for purposes of representation. This had given the South an advantage in the House of Representatives, uh, where membership in the House is determined by overall population, meaning states that have more people get more representation in the House. What the Federalists were proposing was that representation in Congress would be based only on the number of free persons, not including enslaved persons. The second resolution was to limit presidents to only one term and prohibit the election of two presidents from the same state back to back. The goal here was obvious. Uh, the New England Federalists were trying to prevent another Virginia dynasty. Um, so obviously George Washington had been president, four years of John Adams, um, but then we had eight years of Thomas Jefferson, eight years of James Madison, and they didn't realize this, but Madison would be su succeeded by another Virginian, James Monroe, who would also serve two terms. Um, it's what's known as the Virginia dynasty. The New England Federalists are trying to curtail that. And then lastly, the Federalists proposed that there should be a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress to declare war, restrict commerce with other countries, and admit new states to the Union. Um, those decisions uh, at the time of the War of 1812 were by simple majority. 
um, the federals are proposing a two thirds majority being required to make those things more difficult to do or not be able to take those actions without more of a consensus. In the end, the Hartford Convention really isn't all that significant. Um, it was pretty much nullified by news of an overwhelming American victory in Louisiana. In January of 1815, American and British forces fought a battle in New Orleans. General Andrew Jackson, uh, who you can see in this image, he's the guy on the white horse uh, right in front of the first American flag that you see on the right. Um, Andrew Jackson and his combined force of U.S. Army regulars and frontier militia troops, mainly from Tennessee and Kentucky, defeated the British, who were trying to capture New Orleans and gain control of the Mississippi River. In the Battle of New Orleans, the British suffered approximately 2,000 casualties to the Americans, 70. This battle would make Jackson one of the great heroes of the War of 1812 and help launch his political career, which of course ultimately ended in the White House. There's only one problem. The Battle of New Orleans took place after American and British diplomats had signed a peace treaty ending the war on Christmas Eve of 1814. Again, the slow pace of communications in the early 19th century is the big problem here. News of what would come to be known as the Treaty of Ghent did not arrive in the United States until February of 1815, a month after the Battle of New Orleans. The war had basically stalemated by, the, by late 1814. Neither side was gaining the upper hand and both were ready for peace. The British and their powerful military were focusing on the war against Napoleon in Europe. And compared to Napoleon, the War of 1812 was little more than a minor annoyance for the British. Negotiations for a settlement took place in Ghent, Belgium. The lead American negotiator was future Secretary of State and future President John Quincy Adams. He is the guy in the middle of the image here wearing the brown suit. John Quincy Adams, of course, is the son of John and Abigail Adams. According to the provisions of the Treaty of Ghent, the relationship between the United States and Britain essentially returned to what's known as the status quo antebellum. Status quo antebellum is Latin for the situation before the war. Nothing was said about impressment. Nothing was said in the treaty about the violation of neutral rights. It was simply an agreement to stop fighting. Despite the fact that the treaty didn't address impressment or neutral rights, the issues were resolved by the end of war in Europe. Uh, Napoleon, of course, ends up getting defeated at Waterloo. And the end of war in Europe, uh, which is what caused the problems in the first place, ultimately meant that the issues that resulted in the War of 1812 were solved. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is just kind of wrap up um, by talking about the war's legacy. Why is the War of 1812 important um, and why should it not be overlooked um, in history classes? There's a few reasons. Um, first, there's an outpouring of patriotism and nationalism in the United States. Americans believed that they had won a great victory against the British, when in reality, they had merely survived the war. Had the British not been distracted by a much larger war against Napoleon in Europe, the story of the War of 1812 would have ended very differently for the United States. The Federalists were pretty much dead in the water as a viable political party by the end of the War of 1812. In many ways, the Hartford Convention was pretty much the last nail in the Federalist Party coffin. James Madison's successor as president, James Monroe, when he needs to run for re-election, he will not even be opposed um, because the Federalist Party by that point ceases to exist. The staunch opposition of the New England Federalists to the war was in conflict with that wartime patriotism and nationalism that was held by the vast majority of Americans. And in many ways, the Federalists looked disloyal. Um, to the rest of the country. James Madison had kind of mixed results, I would say, as a wartime commander-in-chief, as a war leader. 
The war effort was undeniably poorly managed right from the start. And there's no denying that James Madison is the only president in American history to have most of the nation's capital burned to the ground at the hands of the enemy. But the war did confirm American independence, and it did gain the United States a measure of respect abroad and national glory. Despite the problems with the war effort, Madison does deserve some credit for waging a war in a way that preserved the principles of the Republic. He did not take on the powers of a king or a dictator. He also waged war without violating any American citizens' civil liberties, something which has taken place in other American wars, most notably the Civil War and the two world wars. Americans had survived another war against the British. And America, after the War of 1812, is going to enter into a new period of stability and progress as a nation. The end of the war ushered in an era of economic growth and technological advancement. Policies adopted in the wake of the war included instituting protective tariffs to help American manufacturers compete with foreign producers renewing the charter of the Bank of the United States, putting the United States on a much more um, substantial, stable financial footing, expanding the U.S. military, both the Army and the Navy, and in specifically including enlarging the Corps of Cadets at West Point to ensure that the United States would have plenty of trained officers in any future conflicts. There was also a movement to improve transportation, in the United States by building more roads and more canals. But most importantly, because of the War of 1812, American independence was secure, really for the first time since the end of the Revolutionary War. No longer did Europeans look upon the United States as just a small group of former British colonies, expecting the American Republic to disintegrate into chaos. What is our present situation? Henry Clay asked rhetorically at the end of the War of 1812. He said, quote, respectability and character abroad, security and confidence at home. Our national character and our constitution are placed on a solid basis, never to be shaken, end quote. In the decades to come, fueled by the confidence gained from the War of 1812, Americans would increasingly turn their attention to territorial expansion with the goal of dominating the continent of North America. Okay, and with that, uh, I will stop sharing. And with that, I am happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks so much, Bill. I'm going to read off the first question and please ask questions in the chat as well. Um, can you share some information about the contributions of Black Americans to the War of 1812? Right. So um, certainly during that time period, um, Afri African Americans were not serving um, in large numbers in the U.S. Army at that time. Um, African Americans did, um, before they could serve in the army, they did at times serve in the US Navy. Um, so that is something a lot of times people are not aware of. Um, but obviously given the discrimination that took place at the time um, and certainly the presence of slavery in the United States, that would be a very large, the largest percentage of African Americans in the country at the time, they are not going to be um, permitted to serve in the military um, at that point. Um, certainly enslaved persons would be involved in, for example, maintaining the economy of the United States during the War of 1812. Um, the War of 1812 is also interesting because it was one of the moments that basically because the Royal Navy blockaded uh, the American coast, um, American manufacturing kind of took off um, during that period, particularly um, textiles. And so certainly the Southern cotton that is being cultivated by um, enslaved workers in the South, um, that cotton is ended up is ending up in Northern textile uh, mills, such as like Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, and so certainly African-Americans are making um, a substantial contribution to the economic well-being of the country um, in that sense. 
for any other questions, you can either type those in the chat or in the Q&A um, area. And while we're waiting, I have a question. I'm just curious how the War of 1812 is taught differently in Canada than it would be here, if you know that. <laughs> um, well, it's very interesting because um, I had the chance to take a tour um, in Kingston, Ontario, um, a tour which today is actually the site of uh, the Royal Military College of Canada. Um, but there's also a fort there in Kingston, Ontario. And it's kind of an awkward fort to take a, a tour of as an American um, because we're depicted as the enemy. So it was a fort that was built to defend against an invasion by the United States. And so the way the fort has been interpreted by historians um, and museum workers um, has been to depict the United States as the enemy. And interestingly, when I was there, I was interestingly the only American on the tour. And um, and the tour guide had kind of started out by saying, oh, where's everybody from? And so it actually was a little awkward. And, and for me, the first time I'd ever been in a position to be um, as the American to be depicted as the enemy. Um, so in a lot of ways, that that's how it would be taught. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of like what actually happens in Canadian classrooms, but given how that fort is interpreted, I would assume that's how it's taught, is that in that time period, we were the enemy. All right, thank you. And Jay has shared some um, some resources on African-Americans during the War of 1812 in the chat as well. So if you wanna grab some of those. Our next question is from Alexandra, and this is a really great question. Do you have any suggestions for primary sources that might, might be easy for middle school students to understand? see. I mean, certainly, I would say, like, um, the document that comes out of the Hartford Convention, I mean, it would take a lot of prep and, like, to prepare students for it, but it was intended to be something that would be easily understood by Americans at the time, including people that didn't necessarily have a huge amount of education because they're trying to gain support for those ideas. So I think that would be an interesting way to sort of cover opposition to the war and cover the idea that, well, not everyone's on board with this kind of a thing. Um, I would also look for, I mean, nothing, not a specific one comes to mind right now, but I would look for, um, for example, memoirs of people that may have served um, in the War of 1812 a lot of times particularly among like common soldiers. Like right now I'm reading a book about a, um, a memoir by a Revolutionary War soldier in preparation for my American Revolution course next semester. And a lot of times, um, particularly if it's, if it's a regular soldier, um, a lot of times they didn't have like a really sophisticated um, level of education and it makes their writing a lot easier to understand, including for students of younger ages. And um, a lot of times it's also interesting if they can read something written by a younger person. Um, so I would look for things like that. Like I said, off the top of my head, I can't, one's not jumping right into my mind now, but I would look for personal narratives from the war um, in a lot of ways. I think that would probably be the best way to go. Also historic newspaper accounts. So for example, a newspaper account of the Battle of Lake Erie. Those are usually written at a level that's easily understood. Nice. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Charlene. Uh, would easy access to the U.S. interior have changed the outcome of the war? Well, I think the biggest thing that influences the outcome of the war is the fact that Britain is so heavily distracted. Um, had it not been for what was going on in Europe, had it not been for Napoleon, the United States would have gotten its butt kicked big, big time during the War of 1812. Um, if you just look at the numbers I gave early in my talk, um, the British are fielding a professional army of a quarter of a million soldiers. They have a thousand ships um, in their Navy. If all of that might or a good portion of it had been directed towards the United States, they would have crushed the United States. So um, in a lot of ways, the best way of thinking about the War of 1812 from the British perspective is it's like it was kind of like flotting a fly uh, or swatting at a fly. 
it's like it's an annoyance the buzzing is annoying them but we were never a national security threat to britain um the security threat to them was napoleon and so in a lot of ways the united states got lucky by the fact that the british were distracted we also need to remember like at the early stages of the war it was pretty much a disaster for the united states i mean the canada campaign was a complete failure from start to finish um americans looking back on it are very lucky to have survived the war which is what's interesting because during the war and after the war americans are bragging a lot about hey we whipped the british a second time and all these kinds of things and it's not really an accurate way of looking at the war of 1812 the united states got lucky um is the way it should be interpreted all right fantastic oh, this is a great question from steven how did vet, uh, the veterans of the war who got into politics affect policies on Native Americans after the war and anyone besides Andrew Jackson and Lewis Cass? Okay, well, obviously they're the biggest ones, um, particularly Jackson and Indian removal. Um, so that's obviously the biggest ones. Um, Will, William Henry Harrison, um, it would be interesting if he had not died a month into office, um, it would have been very interesting to see what he would have done based on his um, earlier involvement with Native Americans. Um, I would say in a lot of ways, the fallout from the War of 1812 when it comes to Native Americans and you look at the politicians of that time period, the War of 1812 basically moves into the period that ultimately results in what is known as Manifest Destiny. And obviously the big conflict of that time period is the Mexican-American War um, from 1846 to 1848. A lot of the attitudes that ultimately lead to the Mexican-American War come out of the War of 1812 and the confidence that was gained from Americans and American politicians during the War of 1812 that the Native American threat could be dealt with, um, that that did open up all these vast new lands to the United States um, and kind of bred this idea of manifest destiny, that it was America's destiny to spread westward all the way to the Pacific coast. So coming out of the War of 1812, there is this confidence among politicians because yes, they survived against the British, they soundly defeated Native Americans, um, during that uh, conflict. And that kind of sets the stage for further conquest moving westward um, and certainly for Jackson's Indian removal um, and actions towards Native Americans for the rest of the 19th century. Okay, our next question is an economic history question. Um, oh God. <laughs> can you elaborate on the commercial effect of uh, the rush to shipbuildings on the Great Lakes and what effects that had on the economy. Right. So, I mean, in terms of the shipbuilding on the Great Lakes, that was kind of like um, mainly like a moment in time kind of a thing. Um, so it was a rushed job. Um, both sides basically set up uh, shipyards on either side, on their side of the Great Lakes. Um, and then when the ships were ready, they went out and, and fought the battles of Lake Erie and Lake Champlain. Um, Overall, I mean, in terms of the overall economic impact of the war, as I already mentioned, certainly developing domestic manufacturing and domestic industry is a big part of the War of 1812 because you have that British Royal Navy blockade of the Atlantic coast. And that effectively shut down um, a lot of American trade. So if Americans couldn't get the things that they needed from Europe, um, then basically it encouraged domestic manufacturing and you saw much more in terms of mills sprouting up, textile mills, things along those lines. There was more of a market for it for American manufacturers. And, and that lesson was learned during the War of 1812. So at the very end, I was talking about how the United States gets launched into, um, gets launched into this period of progress and technological advancement and roads are being built and canals are being built. Um, a lot of that was directly the result of the war as well. And the realization that we need to be able to move troops around, move supplies around. Um, 
And there are policies adopted after the War of 1812. So rechartering the Bank of the United States was a really big issue. Um, Democratic Republicans, in many ways, adopted economic policies that were kind of federalist in origin in many ways. But because the federalists were pretty much dead in the water as a viable political party, the Democratic Republicans felt comfortable adopting some of those um some of those economic policies. So the United States emerges from the War of 1812 in a much stronger economic position than it went into um, in a lot of ways. And that's also one of the things that produces a lot of the confidence that Americans have going into that post-War of 1812 period. Um, and ultimately as well also fuels, once we move into that era of manifest destiny, fuels a desire to get to the Pacific coast to get access to markets in the Pacific and in Asia. Um, so the War of 1812 really does propel the United States economically. Okay, great. I'm gonna go out of order with these questions because Kelly, I think your question relates a little bit to what we were talking about. And then I'll circle back to your question, Jen. Uh, so despite the outcome being at best a draw, it led to increased nationalism. Uh, is this mainly because of the surprise victory at New Orleans? Uh, New Orleans is certainly a big part of it. Um, that was a huge victory, and not even just a huge victory in terms of the numbers, um, but there was sort of this attitude at the time among many Americans. Like I mentioned West Point. Um, West Point was not really well known like at the during the War of 1812 era. It's not really going to become a prestigious institution until after the War of 1812. Um, but yeah, New Orleans does feed that nationalism because there was this kind of this idea that was really prominent at the time that Americans were natural warriors and that they didn't need any special education or training to be great warriors. And so they look back to somebody like George Washington, obviously a great general, but Washington had no formal military education or training. Um, and then certainly Andrew Jackson being the, the American commander in New Orleans, Andrew Jackson, same thing, no formal military education or military training, yet he won this overwhelming victory. I mean, 2,000 casualties to 70 um, against an aristocratic, professional British Army general, um, a guy by the name of Pakenham. And so Americans kind of reveled. And it's not even just American regular soldiers. It very much became a story about the Tennessee and Kentucky riflemen um, that were at New Orleans. And even though a lot of the victory came from actually U.S. Army regulars, artillery officers firing cannons, in a lot of ways, the Kentucky and, uh, the Kentucky and Tennessee riflemen um, sort of became the symbol for, like, look at our great natural American warriors defeating these prof British professionals. And so certainly New Orleans plays a big part of it. Um, there's no doubt about that. The naval victories on the Great Lakes certainly contribute to that nationalism. Those one-on-one -on -one naval duels, such as the one um, Old Ironsides fought against the Guerriere, those certainly contribute um, to, to nationalism. So I would say that's really where, where a lot of it comes. Fort McHenry, another great example, um, withstanding a 25-hour bombardment, 1,500 rounds being fired at you. Um, so I'd say for all those reasons, um, that's what's fueling the nationalism. All right. So we've got speed round. We've got about two minutes and three questions. So what is really a yes or no question? Was the war of 1812 supported by the people of the U S for the most part? Yes. I would say really the main area of opposition would be in the new England States, um, by the federalists and even some new England democratic Republicans. Um, who believed it was dangerous for the United States to be taking on the British and that it would ultimately undermine the American economy. All right, great. So, Jen, I didn't forget about you, I promise. Uh, do you think the British had intentions of coming after the United States to get their colonies back after they finished the war with France, considering they were building forts and increasing their military presence throughout the Northwest Territory? Um. I've never really come across anything in the reading I've done that the British wanted to kind of reclaim, um, reclaim their colonies. And, and by the time we got to late 1814, the British were kind of sick of the war as well. Um, and, and certainly part of that was because the war against Napoleon was still going on. Um, but I think the war of 1812 did demonstrate um, 
that that wasn't ever going to take place, that the United States was a real nation by this point. It was capable of defending itself. Um, and that's only going to become more of the case as the 19th century expands or continues going forward. All right. And our last question is from Dale, uh, agreeing that the two Great Lakes maritime heroes you mentioned were worthy. Would you consider Dolly Madison a hero as she rescued U.S. artifacts? Um, Dolly Madison's really interesting because her actions, particularly when the British are advancing on the White House, um, there's kind of some legend, like some people actually believe like she ran in the East room, pulled the painting off the wall and went, like ran out of the White House with it. That is impossible. Dolly Madison was like a very, very petite, small woman. Portrait of George Washington that's in the East room is humongous. Like it would take multiple people to get that off the wall. So she, she certainly directed like people in the White House saying, hey, we need to save this painting kind of a thing. Um, but there have been some legends that cropped up about Dolly Madison that are kind of exaggerating a little bit. Um, she didn't like grab it off the wall, tuck it under her arm and run out into the um, into the night. Um, Dolly Madison is really interesting, a very interesting figure in her own right, like completely the opposite of her husband. Like it's a total opposites attract um, kind of a match. Um, as I said, he was very shy and reserved. She was total opposite. So life of the party, vivacious, friendly. Um, so so do I think she deserves to be considered a hero? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was her direction that said, hey, we need to like save these things that are part of the White House. Um, but yeah, I just didn't want people thinking, oh, wow, that's cool. She pulled this painting off the wall and like ran off with it. Like, no, she didn't. Another fun historical back. Um, so thank you so much uh, for your talk tonight on the War of 1812. I learned a lot of new things, especially really connecting the War of 1812 with the market and commercial revolution, which I feel like I have not done a good job teaching now. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that. And thank you, everyone, for your attendance tonight. You will receive a feedback survey and you will receive an email tomorrow that will confirm your attendance. So thank you so much and I will see everyone soon. Have a great night. Good night.